Welcome to Regrade Request, where two college professors take a second look at questions and answers from around the internet from you, the listener. My name is Professor Will McBurney. And I'm Professor Mark Sheriff. And Will, how are you doing today, sir? I am doing all right. Had a uh, had a, a lovely Memorial Day weekend, although really, you know, it's summer. We're, our schedules are more flexible now. So That's it's true. not, That's not true. as urgent. Uh, uh uh, an extended weekend as I needed at times during the spring. Well, I was very excited because we got some feedback on episode one that I, I wanted to share right here on okay. the top. Uh, this first bit of feedback, uh, let's see here. Let me read it really quick. Who the hell are you and why should we care what you say? Okay. Well, uh, Good question. that bit of feedback, let me see who that's from. That is my brother. So <laughs> thank you. Thank what, you, wait, little brother. Hang also. On. It, when when you say my brother, do you mean literally like your brother, or is that just their screen name? No, it's literally my brother, my oh, brother right. Kevin. Fair enough. <laughs> my, my, uh, and, and also, it was supported by by my friend Ryan, who who was also kind enough, uh, first friend of the show, I guess, uh, to to give that feedback, which is a good point. We mentioned at the top of the show last time that we've been teaching together, but. Why should people care? Uh, how about real quick, Will? What's what's your professional background? Um, so I have been uh, teaching computer science for five years professionally. Before that, I did research background, largely in software engineering, uh, specifically in program comprehension type work. Uh, other than that, I've been a lifelong nerd, and I can prove this. I skipped senior prom to go to National Math Science Bowl. I have a t-shirt and a Frisbee to prove it. (laughs) And in case you were wondering, yes, give a bunch of nerds a Frisbee. There were two broken noses. Oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. Well, uh, as for me, uh, I have been teaching computer science for about 17 years now, I believe, somewhere in that range. Uh, My specialty is in also software engineering. That's the course that uh, Bernie and I have taught together several times. For those of you who don't know, software engineering is the area of computer science about teaching people how to work together to actually build solutions. And my expertise is also in gamification and CS education. So, you know, between the two of us, we've got a couple decades worth of teaching and mentoring. And so that was one of the reasons that we felt like this might be might be a good a good intro a, a good a good thing for us to do uh, i will add question. however <laughs> that when, especially when we get into very specialized topics like we might today because i have a couple questions that indicate it a lot of topics within computer science we, we we care about we're passionate about but we're more hobbyists than we are experts like mm. my my expertise is five years old in program comprehension Right. And I haven't really been hyper engaged in that lately. So so obviously, if you think we're wrong on something, let us know. And, and we'd be certainly very happy to issue corrections. I think both of us would rather become right than assume we are right when we're wrong. So, yeah. Oh, absolutely. By all means, reach out to us, Mark uh, at regraderequest.com, Will at regraderequest.com. Actually, you could put anything at regraderequest.com. It will still get to us. <laughs> um, uh, another another uh, piece of feedback is, I, was, uh, I like the vibe you're going for. Uh, it seems kind of like car talk, except less car and more tech. And I like that. I think that 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 seems like a good area to go in because plenty of people are listening to car talk without doing a lot of car stuff. So I don't know. Maybe we can. Aim what more sound questions is your windows to... making? Is it more of like a bung, bung, or is it a? If it's making that noise, I actually have no clue what's going on because that's not a Windows noise. Uh, okay. All right. All right. All right. Let's let's get to it. Let's get to it. I, I let off last time. Do you want to lead yes. off this time? All right. So this is this is going to our our mutual interest in gaming, but it brings in a bit of networking. Um. So this is actually from the Overwatch, uh, subreddit, and this is okay. a little bit old, but not too old. That's. Uh, first of all, let me say I don't know what DDoSing, if that's even a term, is or how it works. All I know is that it's an, it's an inconvenience to me because it keeps happening to Blizzard. I would assume <laughs> they would be able to get some sort of protection to guard themselves from this, correct? Why haven't they gotten this protection? Is it more complicated than that? 
how does preventing it work and why does it keep happening? So so this is a great, I, I like this question because I see it a lot in a lot of different gaming forms. Why don't they just get DDoS protection? Um, you know, like Amazon on Cyber Monday, people try to DDoS them and, and that that doesn't seem to ever have a major impact, but like Reddit can get DDoSed or Blizzard can get DDoSed or Steam can get DDoSed and that seems to have a problem. So I guess um, that's kind of the question. Do you have any initial thoughts on it? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is is give a definition for yeah. DDoS. So a distributed denial of service attack. So, so the, well, the, let's start the, with a denial of service attack, and then we'll exactly. add in the distributed. So, Absolutely. So, Mark, you know, the, the world is opening up. I actually went to a restaurant for the first time last week in well over a year. Oh, delicious! Um, it went went to Crobies actually, which is which is oh. not far from from where uh, we live. It's actually quite lovely, and the best metaphor I can give for a denial of service attack is this: so Mark Sheriff goes into the restaurant with his family, and I decide that I'm going to ruin his day because I'm a mean spirited. And how is this different than any other day of the week? Right, I, I'm a very mean spirited, bald, tiny little man, and so. <laughs> I, I, I decide that I'm going to ruin this. And what I do is I go into the restaurant and every single time the server is about to go over to Sheriff's table, I interrupt the server and say, hey, can you give me a glass of water? Hey, can you give me a glass of water? Hey, can you give me a glass of water? Because I'm a thinker and I know they're not going to charge me for the glass of water and I'm just wasting the server's time. Now, eventually, the server's just going to ignore me, right? Because I'm just some asshole in the restaurant, right? <laughs> So then I get, okay, let me clone myself. And I clone hundreds of copies of myself, and we fill every corner of the restaurant to where the this Raider just has to shove through me. Now? I've had nightmares. Yeah, this this actually happened, and, and I still haven't really apologized, and I don't plan to. Um, <laughs> any, <laughs> especially to the International Scientific Community for Human Cloning. Anyway, um... Of course, after a while, they're just going to say, okay, well, look, we know what this Will McBurney guy looks like. He kind of looks like proof that Adam Savage from Mythbusters and Louis C.K. had a test tube baby, right? So we're just going to kick everyone <laughs> who looks like that out of our restaurant, right? And and that is a denial of service attack, and that's a way to mitigate it. Hey, we know this person is causing problems. We know they're trying to create millions of false meaningless requests. So let's just kick all the Will McBurney's out of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So what is the difference between that and a distributed denial of service tech? Well, the distributed... Well, you would pay oh, other people to do the same thing. Right. You would convince... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you'd convince a whole bunch of other people who don't necessarily look like you to make the same... To make the same uh, attack, so mm -hmm. to speak. But in the case of computers, this is often done by malicious software being installed on people's computers and you don't have any say about it. So this would be you have brainwashed these people to mm -hmm. do this yelling at the at the server. Yeah. And, and so what you end up with is it's a lot harder because you can't just close your doors and say, OK, no one no one can come in unless they're buying something because. Everyone who comes to the door is potentially a real customer who's really mm -hmm. going to buy something. And the problem is the only way to know if they're a real or fake customer is to bring them in, treat them like a real customer. And then if they start being disruptive, you can remove them. But the ratio in the case of a DDoS attack of malicious, not real customers to actual customers is, is very problematic. And so the other problem is because it's different people, you can't just say, oh, let's kick all the Will McBurney's out of the restaurant. Right. Because it's not going to be Will McBurney's. It's going to be, you know, I'm going to hire all the students in our class to come and harass Mark Sheriff while he's eating. Right. Hypothetically, of course, not, Hypothetically, not for real. Of course. Um, uh. Don't I, ignore that email to the class that I sent. It's not relevant. Yes. Thank you. Um, so so the problem becomes. How do you distinguish from a real customer and a fake customer? And, and from a server standpoint, this is done, as Sheriff mentioned, often with what we would call botnets. These botnets can be um, often created by creating some type of virus, and there'll be some hidden process, say, on my computer, 
that is acting as a fake customer pinging servers and harassing their, them. And it can be done at such a small scale on my computer that I may not even notice the virus is there unless I really look for it. But if you do this on the scale of, say, millions of infected machines, and by the way, we're seeing a lot of this with the Internet of Things. There's a lot of infected mm -hmm. refrigerators out there and uh, infected Malicious cars. refrigerators. Well, they're, yeah. they're like, so car software is notoriously very, very virusable. I don't know if that's a word. Virusable? But if you <laughs> connect your word. car, but if you connect your car with like your Wi-Fi, for example, it can behave in that way. Because mm -hmm. it turns out that phones, cars, and refrigerators don't tend to have antivirus software on them. Even yeah, though you catch they're, Prius 19. Yeah. Sorry, that was terrible. <laughs> yeah. So, so why doesn't Blizzard just get by DDoS protection? Because one, they do, but two, you can't tell someone is a disruptive customer until they, as a customer, start being disruptive. And, and right. that's that's the difficulty of stopping a distributed denial of service attack. Because you can't just block an IP. You also have things like IP spoofing. You know, like telemarketing calls now are all from your area code, right? Or your own number. <laughs> right, or, or, or your own number. But it'll be the same, like, first six digits, area code. Sure. And then the regional code. And then the four digits are random. They're not actually calling from your area. They're spoofing that number. You can spoof IPs, such as through a VPN, which I'm using to have this conversation right now. There you go. So that, that's why you can't just say, well, let's just stop a DDoS. You can't. Um, you can block <laughs> known bots as they become disruptive. But the problem is these bots pro proliferate so fast that unless you have untold server resources, like Amazon, who for the longest time, their primary business model, and still is, is servers. It's not Amazon.com. It's the servers. Mm -hmm. And they have so many of them that on Cyber Monday, they're fine because they have enough servers, you know, to, to handle any DDoS like I handle the ants in my backyard. Right. But even if there is malicious traffic, mm -hmm. they have the ability to not only they have such a large serving staff, so to speak, mm -hmm. that they can just pour water all day while still selling you right. everything else. Right. Yeah. There we go. And. and and there are ways of, of detecting patterns of traffic um, as well. So so there it is an active research area mm -hmm. that, um, you know, there are special security companies that 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 look into this. But it, unfortunately, you know, everyone is one upping each other. The security experts are one upping the uh, malicious uh, parties. The malicious parties come up with new ways of doing uh, distributed denial of service attacks. And it, it's uh, so, uh, computer security is something that. You know, it's it's an arms race, so to speak. Yeah. It's a it's a predator prey relationship in a lot of ways. Um, yeah. The uh, the prey adapts to avoid the predator. The predator adapts to catch back up with the prey. All right. Well, Good that question. was my question. Uh, yeah, I like that. That yeah. Start with some education. I like it. I, let's stay in the education realm. This has a computer science bend to it because it's an algorithmic thinking sort of thing, but it's something you can apply to everyday life. And this question comes from Stack Overflow, and the question is, how can I pair socks from a pile efficiently? Okay. So if you think about this, yesterday I was pairing the socks from clean laundry and figured out I was doing it in a very inefficient way. I was doing a naive search. I would pick one sock and then effectively iterating over the entire pile of socks to find the pair. This would take a factorial amount of time in order to do, but I'm a computer scientist. Can't I figure out a better way? to sort my socks, mm -hmm. to which the easy answer to this is, you're a computer scientist, you should buy all white socks, and you're done. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> buy everything all white just matches. socks of the, of the same length, same brand, same size, and and, and you're done. The, the amount of time that I save not matching socks by only owning, I have all white socks and I have one black pair of socks for my suit, which I have worn, like, to my wedding, and um, <laughs> that's it. That's it. That's the, that was it. And black black sock day at UVA. That was it. Oh no, I wore um, it during graduation. 
uh, for, okay. for, for, well, my, for my that's PhD. Black Sock Day. So, so that's, twi- that's twice. Yeah, that's tie wearing day is also yeah. a graduation. So, so okay. Naively, if we look at sorting mm-hmm. and everything is the same, then okay, then it, it, it's easy, right? Mm-hmm. So let's expand. So now let's just say you have white socks and khaki socks. Mm-hmm. The obvious answer here probably is you make a pile of the white socks, mm-hmm. a pile of the khaki socks. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's expand this further. Now you have white and khaki and navy blue. And so you see that how this works is you start breaking into patterns. So this mm-hmm. is called hashing. We right. are putting these we're putting these socks into distinct piles where we can operate over them much easier. So if you literally had a hundred different pairs of socks, what would you do if they are all different? How would you expand this algorithm? So this is where it gets um, a bit tricky because the first thought I have is, Let's do some type of first hash everything into sets like we talked about, maybe by color, for example. But most likely the white, uh, the white set is going to be abnormally large compared to all the other sets. Right. So one idea would be to then try to sort those socks and then do the matching that way. but, But then the question becomes, what criteria do you sort on? Effectively, when you get down to it, all sorting is somewhat arbitrary in the sense that the criteria you choose to sort on is selected at the time you want to sort. Like, there's no fundamental reason that numbers have to be ascending or descending. You could do, like, all the even numbers first, sort it alphabetically by digit, and then all the odd numbers in descending order. Like, you could do crazy weird things. So with but socks, what you want is something that yeah. you can pick out quickly at run, like at go time. Yeah. So so it is good to divide, subdivide the piles of socks into as small of piles as we can, such mm-hmm. that, however, two identical socks would be more or less hashed to the same pile. That is, they end up to the in same the same pile. pile. Yep. And and yep. so color may not be the only metric we can use because again. The vast majority of socks, or certainly the plurality, I don't want to necessarily make any overly bold bold claim of uh, of of the numbers of socks of different colors in the world. But I mean, I have my Star white. Wars pile. I yeah. have my Google pile. Mm. I have my uh, Argyle pile. You know, that's a that's a fun thing to say. Argyle but most pile. Most cotton white. And so from there, we could subdivide into things like um, length, for example, ankle socks. Mm-hmm. Versus knee high socks versus, you know, high ankle socks. You could subdivide it there and so on and make the piles as small as you can while still making sure that they're unique and clearly well defined enough such that you end up with the socks in the same pile. Um, so I, I think you can only go so far with that, though, before your criteria gets so hard, at least for you as a human being to judge, that you'd be mm-hmm. making too many subjective decisions. Like two similar socks could end up in different piles, for example. So once you have this pile, how would you sort it? Or how would you, no, that's, sorry, pair it? Well, you, hey, you get to a point where uh, the, the matching is trivial. Mm-hmm. Because if you go major color, and then you go by major design, and then at that point, you probably, I mean, I'm making some assumptions about people's sock drawer, but at, th- at this point, you're probably working with two or three pairs of socks total in a given pile. Then it's just iterative matching at that point. Mm. So we have the hash algorithm plus the the um, the 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 normal order in just iterative algorithm, which is probably the best you're going to do until you get to parallelism and you make other people do it for you. Yeah. Which improves or, even more. And this is this is this is my actual solution. Uh, just wear long jeans and and nobody will see your socks and you can wear whatever the hell you want and nobody will care. Or I was actually thinking socks in the in the time of COVID. What are these socks and shoes <laughs> yeah. things you are referring to? I have been wearing slippers and flip flops for yeah. fourteen months, and yeah, so, it's it harder to match socks um, once once you get uneven holes as well. <laughs> there you go. I, I'm matching based upon wear and tear on the sock. So I like this question for us because 
it is something very computer science ish. Mm-hmm. It is you know algorithmic thinking. It's a way of showing how you know the idea of, of sorting socks is something that you know people deal with or sorting things in general, and. This is what we do with data. So imagine that we're trying to deal with, you know, the information coming from, you know, the GPS information from a phone to determine people's movement patterns. Like there's just any do- data set you want to think of. So today we, we learned two... today I learned that Mark Sheriff is a spook. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, there you go. I, yep. You, CIA I, spook you, right here. So should we move now now that we've had our 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 legit real mm-hmm. car talk, computer talk sort of stuff, and we dip down to the silly stuff now? Sure. Um, or unless you have another really well, this, meaningful this question. This one is kind of kind of a, a foot in both camps. Okay. How can I purposely throttle my own internet so it looks like my Zoom connection is bad? I assume <laughs> this was asked by one of our students. This comes oh from my Reddit gosh. No Stupid Questions. Please don't I, so, judge. Hang on. I love, I love. So the question was, how can I purposely throttle my own internet? So it looks like my Zoom connection is bad. And the, the, the text for this is, please don't judge me. Just answer the question if you know the answer. Oh, my gosh. I, 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 excuse me. I assume yeah, uh, you, you might have seen the, the students in elementary school or, or high school, middle school on their Zoom calls, and they rename themselves to reconnecting and then kill their camera. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, or they know, maybe just, that's they just, the... they just play a video loop of you know stuttering and the mouth moving but words not coming out type thing. Yeah, yeah. there's the there's the pro gamer move right there. <laughs> um, how do you throw it? Uh, I, have, I have some ideas. You go to my parents' house, whose internet apparently came out of 1999, and uh, it's just fast enough to load Google's homepage. Yeah. So you have to drive to my parents' house and connect to their Wi-Fi. That's the quickest answer yeah. I can think of. Well, so on on that note, so my my my, my family's from from West Virginia. Um, my brother, sister, and and parents still live there. And one of the issues they have, pardon me, one of the issues they have is that uh, their their broadband services, like technically they have broadband because they have a modem in their house that can handle broadband speeds. But all of the infrastructure that handles the internet is basically was built during like dial-up era or mm-hmm. not, much, not much later. And so the problem is, is like, imagine if... Everyone in the country owned like a Bugatti Veyron, but there were only one lane gravel roads everywhere. <laughs> that that's kind of the best way I can describe yeah. the internet infrastructure in West Virginia. And they call See, it thought- broadband, and legally they've been able to escape that. So move to West Virginia. There are admittedly some downsides to living in West Virginia. <laughs> See, I thought you were saying that the broadband in West Virginia was when the the bluegrass band has a jug and a washboard wow. that they're playing. Okay. It's quite a broad band, sir. Sir, that is that is my people that you are stereotyping, <laughs> and 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 frankly, despite your stereotype being completely and totally accurate, I am offended. Mm. Oh well. Um. No. No. I a, a million apologies. All right. So so one and well, but that gets to why is internet so bad. In the in the U.S. and and I know this is a tangent, but one of the things that that is different in a lot of European countries is that the the company that owns the physical network, the wire, is different from the company that uses the wires to get information into your house. Mm-hmm. And so, like one co- basically one company owns owns the roads, the other company owns the trucks that ship data back and forth. Um, that, so, so that helps a bit, um, in the U S almost everywhere, the, the wire, the wire and the transmitter on the wire are the same company. Um, so in this case, think like Comcast mm -hmm. with your cable line or Xfinity or Time Warner or pick your company. But, but, but then the other factor is, is simply population density. I mean, the population density in, so the population density in Europe there's only one U.S. state that is, like, comparable to it, and it's New Jersey. If you look at, mm-hmm. like, the most European countries, you know, I m- maybe roll out, like, Norway, since it's, it's pretty remote. And certainly, you know, Denmark is thrown off by Greenland, right? 
But but like you look at England, for example, or you look at France or Germany, population density is way higher than the U.S., which means the wire doesn't have to go as far to reach more customers. So certainly there there is a physical factor there um, as, as well. But that's mm-hmm. kind of a tangent. Um, so how can this user throttle their Internet short of picking up their lives and moving to a place they otherwise might not want to live <laughs> West Virginia or my parents' house. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, so it, most people's bandwidth, mm-hmm. uh, particularly if you're thinking about cable bandwidth, you have a much higher amount of down bandwidth. So the, the ability to watch videos, watch your Netflix, whatever that bandwidth seems to be way higher than your upstream bandwidth, which is your bandwidth for sending information to the internet. So correct in my house right now, I've got about 400 plus coming down megabits coming down and about 10 to 12 going up. Yeah. So if, if I really want to crush my bandwidth for sending upstream, I would upload a large video to YouTube and Except, that yeah. will that will hose it because that will take up most of that 12 megabits. And and to be clear, they are different channels. It's not like they both go through the same channel. And and it, so it so if you had say like, oh, well, let me just watch like eight Netflix videos at the same time during class. That won't affect your upload. It will certainly affect your Correct. download. It won't affect your mm-hmm. upload. So you have to make sure that you're uploading. Now, this becomes a problem if you're using. So what we were talking about is more traditional cable broadband. Mm -hmm. If you're on fiber optic, which um, I'm actually thinking of switching to soon. See, the the difference is... It's coming to my neighborhood, too. Yeah. The difference with fiber optic is that the down speeds and up speeds are much more close to each other. Equivalent. Yep. And so, if you have an up speed and you want to throttle your internet you're going to potentially run into issues. Also, something you need to be aware of, data caps. Although with broadband, I'm not seeing as much, although I don't know if that's likely to be a permanent state or if that's just a way to entice new customers. I know a lot of data caps were waived at the start of COVID. Most of them are back. For example, I have a one terabyte data cap per month for my home internet, not not for mobile. And so Hmm. if I start downloading more than that, I will actually have to pay more. I think there's also an upload cap but I'm not sure what it is. Hmm. So you, you, I, you're going to have to do some math, break out, break out your, your cable bill and no, figure it out. I've got it. I just thought of it. Okay. What you do is you put your cable modem on a Christmas tree timer. Okay. And so every 10 minutes, it just kills power and comes back and kills power and comes back. And then it's just going to look like you have crappy internet anyway. Yeah. Uh, the other option, there you go. the other option is don't just focus on the internet, focus on your processor, you know, Start start running some some uh, some benchmarks in the background. Now you might melt your computer doing this, so so it's a trade off. Like, do you want to pay attention in class, or do you want to work, or do you want a computer that doesn't work anymore? Which of those two things do you most want? Oh, well, you can have other issues of this, too, because we have both had students, or at least I know I have, because we do office hours through Discord through through COVID days. And for those of you that don't use Discord, it's, it's you know, a chatting client. It's like Slack or things like that, but it's very gamer focused. So it even mm-hmm. shows what game you're currently playing if you don't turn that off. And we'll have students come to our office hours saying, uh-huh, I'm listening to you, Professor Sheriff, Professor McBurney. And we look at their status. It says playing League of Legends. And it's like, yeah. really? How... How is that going? <laughs> yeah. Well, so the the the, oh, the, the queue. Don't don't worry. Kind kind of related to that is I'll have cases where you know um like a, a, a student will will say like you know they're meeting with their group and they'll still be on that game and people in the group will notice and email us and be like hey by the way during our group meeting. This person who says that they're trying really hard and they just can't get anything done. Yeah, they were in League of Legends the whole time. <laughs> and so, also, mm. for the note, I had to disable this feature, not because during the workday I was doing anything, but because, like, if it were late at night and people saw I was in a game, they're just like, oh, well, it's free office hours because he's on the <laughs> clock 24-7. Let me yes. message him. And so I've disabled that feature uh, just yeah, for my own end because here's the thing. Uh, professors need a work-life balance too. And to be clear, that balance has skewed heavily work in the last year. It is, uh, it is, it's ha- it is like a lot big, big, big work, little bit of life. And yet, uh, that, that, 
you know, when you have uh, two, when you're part of two courses that combined have 900 students, there's always more work to do. So, uh, yeah. What was our question yep. about again? <laughs> we talked about yeah. Thrawn. <laughs> oh yeah, Thrawn. So uh, the short Thrawn, answer Thrawn, Thrawn. is um, actually here's one you could uh, you can get. Uh, so th- this is actually a real answer. You can do this in no. um, in Chrome. Um, you okay. can you can go to a like the Zoom window. Right click inspect in the windows of opens up select network and then so let me just test this real quick. So we're, we're recording. Hey, wait a minute. Don't hang on. No, 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 <laughs> no, no. no. I, I got this. I got this. I know we're recording live. So, yeah, so it's you can do this. So go to go to the network drop down and then you can select um, basically rather than do uh, for online, you can change that to slow 3G. So you can you can simulate oh what your internet would be if you were using a uh, slow 3G in a particular browser window, and and the reason that's there is for the sake of testing. You know, you want to test sure. your website yeah, yeah. with people who might not have 4G or the dreaded 5G, or you know, they might only have slow D, slow 3G internet. So you want to test your website, make sure it works with that. Well, right, or you can throttle your internet so you don't have to pay attention in class. Both very valid use cases. But that I'm that sure is, Google that intended. Is, yeah, yeah. All right, there you go. Oh man, that was yeah, that was a good one. So awesome. So that, that was All the right. answer given, and I just tested it. It appears to work. That's why I didn't hear anything you just said for the past five minutes. <laughs> I'm assuming it all got recorded and everything is still good. Okay. Um, one more question. Sure. We're going to dip back into, into silly territory here. I mean, I know that, that last week it was. How do you lick a plane? Licking. Yeah. How do you not, lick not a plane? Goat licking, plane licking via goats. Very different. You don't want to lick a goat. You don't know where that goat has been. Probably a barn. Mr. Pro- yeah. <laughs> Professor McBurney, yes. um, coming to you from the Arcade Stack Exchange. Okay. How can I tell if a corpse is safe to eat? I'm a human wizard and I just killed a monster leaving a corpse on the ground. How can I tell whether it's safe to eat the corpse? I left the monster because I'm just not interested in, in, the, in whether it's edible or not, but I really want to know, how would I know if a particular monster is edible? Did, did you start the question with a human corpse or was did I just fill that in? With my dark tendencies towards cannibalism, I guess. I am a human wizard and oh, I just I'm a killed human a wizard. monster. Okay, sorry. So you can you can expand upon yeah. uh so th- this is I not just only learned a... something about myself that I really didn't want to open that closet door. Well, anyway. So so this not only goes into uh a video game, but this is also more of a role playing Dungeons yeah, and Dragons. Sure. All right, McBurney, you are you right. are a human wizard. I can see it in your eyes. There is the power of the the infinite on, take sparkling. Off. Yeah, take that's off not the glasses, anymore, sparkling, reflecting off the head. I love it. So now, you have killed a monster. Yes. How do you how how do you know if it's safe to eat or not? Well, in this case, it seems like the wizard had killed the monster a bit ago. So regardless the the monster species, I assume it is no longer safe to eat because it sounds like it's been a while. Um. So you have to make that decision. Oh, we all know. You, know, you yeah. leave hamburger out. You leave yeah. you leave some pasta out. You leave a monster out. Yeah, you, you, you leave a dire it. wolf just sitting there and it's just like I, the flies come. Mm, yeah. Um, yes, okay, no. so, so first. Bacteria. There's an important distinction to make, and this always comes up. Um, the distinction between venomous and poisonous. Mm. Remember, something yes, is poisonous. Are aware if, of this. if you eat something and you die, it's poisonous. If it bites you and you die, it's venomous. That's the difference. So That's now, true. keep in mind something like a snake, for example. You can eat a venomous snake, provided you presumably don't eat the venom sex, which I would That's imagine. That's right. Delicious. Yeah. Which, you know. Um, Haven't got that, quite to that point during yeah. COVID. But then, I mean, th- this this is also a, a, a tougher question because, you know, like there's there's a certain type of sushi that involves a puffer fish and it's a particularly poison. And it's a, it's strict, both venomous and poisonous puffer fish. And so you have to cut it in a very specific way. And if you mess up, the person who eat it will go to the hospital and probably die. 
Um, which I only know about from that one specific episode of The Simpsons. That's the I, <laughs> that, I, that I is actually the think it was from a Visa commercial, if I remember right. <laughs> That's where you learned it from. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just remember that episode of The Simpsons vividly. Yeah. No, it it is absolutely a real thing. Um, well, of course. Simpsons don't lie. What are you talking about? Yeah. Simpsons did it. Um. Okay. So so we it has to be a deeper question than not just can you eat a particular monster. But then, can you eat certain parts of the monster? So first, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, okay, uh, a Gorgon probably can't eat any of it. Especially okay. if you killed it with a mirror shield, because it's going to probably be chip a tooth. Stone, then. Right? It's going to yeah, chip a tooth. That's hard. Yeah. Extra crispy. Yeah. Um, that said, I think you could absolutely eat a dire rat. I'm not saying it would taste particularly good. Um, but you could probably eat a diorette, especially if it were like in a, in a, uh, a tavern basement, not in the wild. Cause there's frankly mm-hmm. not a lot of parasites there. Probably living a happy rat life. Doesn't have a lot of stress. Not likely to contain too many diseases. Now, of course that changes if there's a local bubonic plague outbreak, you, 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 you make your own decision as, as it comes to diorettes. Sure. Sure. It, p- personal decision, personal responsibility here mm-hmm. with diorette snacking. Yeah. Um, See, my question is, okay. is, as a human wizard, how did you kill it? Did you kill it with fire? It could already be roasted. Yeah, it could already be roasted. It could already... Or did you kill it with poison? That could be... Yeah, it could be a problem. Worse. could be a bit of a problem. That could be a problem. You, a, a nice uh, yeah, a frost spell. You you have frozen it. Mm-hmm. So now it's preserved. Yeah. yeah. You can chip off pizza, uh, pieces of that, take it with you. Do you think there's um, a barbecue yeah. sauce spell? That, that, would be, that, would, that would be handy in this universe. Just... <laughs> A spell that slathers I, slathers something in barbecue sauce to death. I cast honey mustard level three. It's, it's super delicious. effective and super it delicious. Is, it's super effective and super delicious. Well, I I really want to read a fair portion, at least a portion of the answer that was given okay. here, because my goodness, the folks over at Arcade, here we go. First off, no matter the corpse, never eat unless you have just made sure that the corpse or you have the method of preservation, such as an icebox. Rotten corpses cause food poisoning unless you're a fungus or a ghoul, and it doesn't take very long for a corpse to rot. And there isn't a visual indication of rotting either, so the safe bet is never to eat anything you just didn't just kill. By the way, most undead corpses are automatically rotten. So see below for a more technical explanation. If the monster has poison or acid attacks, ah, very good, McBurney, or is made of poison, that obviously sounds bad, then there's a very high chance you'll be poisoned and take acid damage. Both of these can be fatal. The former even instantly send you on a really good trip. Oh, boy. Uh, But the poison and acid resistance will protect against this. So make sure, folks, roll those D20s to see if you save against poison if you're going to snack on this stuff. Note that most poisonous corpses will give you a chance uh, on that poison resistance. So this can be something to risk if you have enough health. Other elemental effects like fire, cold, and electricity traditionally you're safe while you're taking a snack. If the monster causes you to be stunned, hallucinating, or confused by natural attacks, then it's highly likely you'll be tripping pretty good after you eat this corpse. (laughs) Some of these are very obvious. Actually, most creatures with negative effects like petrification will also carry over that effect with their corpse. McBurney, it is like you read this answer. I actually did not. I did not. I am am so incredibly impressed. Uh, (laughs) I'm giving you... I am giving you an A okay. on whether you can uh, eat the corpse. I mean, I, I've had a lot of practice. I mean, what? No, what? What? No. <laughs> I I said nothing of the sort, sir. How how dare you impugn my character with these so, with folks, these accusations that you bandy about? When you are out, when you're out gaming. Be careful of those corpses. Make sure you know what you are eating. I know that we have all been inside for a long time and you're just ready to get back to a restaurant, but don't just find any old kobold or wraith or bat or, oh God, no bat, no bats. I, no I bats. wouldn't imagine kobolds would taste very good. They, I, I imagine their meat would be very, very tough. Uh, reading down into the answer, kobolds are always poisonous. Oh. According I, to this answer. I didn't know that. Well, uh, good good thing. Good thing I. Good thing I have the internet to prevent me from eating fictional creatures. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we do. So if you're out, if you're out there ready for for some gaming, 
Come into the summertime. There you go. Well, let's recap. We started um, DDoS talking. Started with DDoS. So a little I bit said of we, explanation. We started talking about DDoS attacks. Oh gosh, are you going to DDoS me while I'm DDoS, while I'm talking about DDoSing? I mean, so we start talking about DDoS attacks, though. So. <laughs> and then, so then we start talking uh, about DDoS attacks. Oh jeez, I saw this coming a mile away. Okay. Oh wait, no. And so then, far, this is just so we started talking about DDoS attacks. Yeah, that's gonna so be. So we started great. talking oh, yeah, about can... DDoS attacks. Oh, All right, geez. I'm done. Are you? Are you? I am. Are you really? Done. I'm done. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. <sighs> Then we talked about sorting socks, moved on to how do you ruin the quality of a Zoom call, (laughs) and ended with how do you know if you can eat a corpse? By the way, I just found another way to ruin the quality of a Zoom call. Just a few seconds ago. (laughs) Get right up on your microphone and make weird, loud, annoying sounds. Well... (laughs) Uh, anything, anything else from you, McBurney, before we call it a, call it an episode? No, no, I certainly appreciate the feedback we got from the, from the first episode. So keep that coming. And we really do appreciate you hanging out with us for the past 40 minutes. Plus, uh, we are having fun doing this. We hope you enjoy listening to it. Uh, if you have any feedback, please do let us know. Mark at regradequest.com, will at regradequest.com, at Mark Sheriff on Twitter, at prof underscore McBurney, also on Twitter. And as always, remember, watch for falling goats. Actually, it's just prof see, McBurney, no see, underscore. See, I made it, I made it stick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, it worked. And we'll, we'll see how long that lasts. By the way, just prop McBurney, no, no underscore on.